so um, testing, uh, I would say testing is now two years into the pandemic, still a very important issue. Um, I think we, we are still in need of um, frequent, fast and accurate testing to come back to the country, to get, send our kids to school, to go to work. Um, but also to, as we heard um, earlier, to potentially see if somebody should be treated with antivirals early. So um, um, I think the, 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 the landscape currently is that the antigen tests that we all you know, use and like uh, are very easy to use, but they are unfortunately not very accurate, uh, while the PCR test is still the, the golden standard, but, uh, but takes too long and is expensive. So we have come to testing um, for SARS-CoV-2 um, really because of a long-standing collaboration between uh, my lab, Jennifer Downer's lab, and Dan Fletcher's lab, uh, both from Berkeley, but also both with an affiliation at the Gladstone Institute in San Francisco. Um, and we have been thinking about this before SARS-CoV-2, um, and, and we're actually looking for an at-home test um, for HIV. However, two years ago in 2020, January 2020, we pivoted this effort um, to SARS-CoV-2 because um, of the obvious need for, um, for, for, for testing um, and, um, and have really focused um, full time on, on seeing what uh, CRISPR testing could bring. So the idea is really um, to combine Jennifer's uh, Nobel Prize winning CRISPR technology and Dan's, um, Dan Fletcher's pioneering work in using mobile phones as, um, as, as a diagnostic reader. Um, what we set out to do was to use an, uh, an, an enzyme called Cas13A. Others have used this as, a, as an RNA recognizing um, CRISPR enzyme. Um, so if you combine it with a, uh, with a guide, which would be SARS-CoV-2 specific, um, it would find uh, SARS-CoV-2 in a sample, become activated. Um, and when it becomes activated, it not only um, cleaves the target RNA, but it also has collateral um, um, nuclease activity, which you can harness for a diagnostic by just providing small strip of an RNA with a quencher and a fluorophore. If it gets cut, it starts glowing. And then you can uh, basically measure this with a plate reader in the lab, or we were um, um, wanting to use the mobile phone as a mobile reader of this of the signal. And, um, and I would say the, um, the, the interesting part of, uh, of what we were doing is, is that we really wanted to use CAS13A as a direct detector. We did not want to combine this with any reverse transcription and amplification step, which others have done in order to increase sensitivity. Um, but we really wanted to use it as a simple uh, test for direct detection of the viral RNA, similar like an antigen test is basically detecting um, viral protein. And so um, when we pivoted this assay from, um, from HIV to SARS-CoV-2, we used sequences that were, with a sequence that was published, we developed these guide RNAs. Um, and these are literally the first 15 guide RNAs that we were testing. Um, and we could see that some of them um, have good activity here. And you see this over time, you see, um, um, the the um, the um, um, the fluorescence that you accumulate over time, and that is being captured, and you see that some of them are, are less good or not not good at all because they do not differentiate between a sample that has a target with a with a sample that has no target. But it became very clear, even the best guide RNA that we were using was in a range of 100,000 copies per microliter as a, as a detection limit, which is absolutely not usable for a, for a diagnostic. But what became very quickly um, obvious is that when we started to combine the guides um, along the open reading frame of or the, the genome of the, of the virus, um, we could get um, very good additive and, and somehow sometimes also synergistic effects, bringing us in an area where we actually had, um, you know, diagnostic value. And so initially we worked with a three guide um, combination that we also published um, and then moved on to an eight guide combination that we now have very highly vetted 
um, against all the, var the variants. That means that these eight guides are unaffected by any variant. It detects um, uh, all of the variants, including uh, Omicron, but is not cross-reactive with any other viruses or our own um, um, our own um, RNAs. And with these eight guide combination, um, with other tweaks that I'm going to tell you in a minute, we have now come to a limit of detection of 10 copies per microliter, which is in the range of the PCR, which is one copy per microliter in, in general. And I think one, one thing that is very important here is that we switched from a simple endpoint detection where you just stop the assay at 30 minutes and then see if it's positive or negative to a slope algorithm um, where we can actually call reactions much earlier positive and also have a much better sensitivity. The other important part uh, in that, in that um, optimization process was actually the mobile phone. Initially, when we started out to use the mobile phone as a, as a, as a camera, we were thinking that it had to become as good as the, as the plate reader in the, ca in, the, in, the, in the lab. However, it turned out that it's actually 10 times better. So this, what we're showing you here, is literally our first prototype that, uh, that Dan's lab uh, generated in the lab, where you have a Google Pixel 4 phone lying on top of this black box, which also has a little light source or a laser inside. Um, and you load the samples actually here on the side, there's a little opening, and you have three channels basically where you have um, a positive, a negative, and a, in a, in a, in a sample. Um, and then you have the, the, the mobile phone run everything, um, the, the algorithm, the acquisition, everything. And when we compare this with um, the plate reader signal and the Pixel 4, you can see here immediately that the Pixel 4 is actually much better than the plate reader in, um, in acquiring signal uh, because it's much less noisy and just simply because the camera quali quality that we all appreciate with our mobile phones today are really also translating into being better diagnostics. And so we have, we had about 10 times um, less noisy uh, for, the, for the mobile phone and that translates in 10 times better sensitivity. And so for our original uh, uh, um, you know, study, we could show that when we used um, here five positive samples that we, um, that we actually acquired from, um, from the BioHub at that, at that time in, in different ranges of, um, of viral loads, we could test all of them positive uh, with 100% accuracy within five minutes. <clears throat> so this was the proof of principle. And we have since, moved this um, very much into two different directions. Uh, we have worked with a commercial partner who is building a fully automated cartridge and a reader that is incorporating the mobile phone camera in order to, to read this. Um, and, um, and that has very good um, sensitivity and specificity. We're testing this prototype uh, next month uh, with a series of, uh, of 100 uh, clinical samples that we collected specifically for that study. Um, but we're also working on this, um, you know, very low key um, um, and, and much less expensive version here um, with, a, with a CRO where we're developing this pen live, um, you know, uh, structure where we put the, 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 the swab in. Um, have developed the lysis solution. There's no RNA extraction um, um, uh, required. You um, have to unfortunately heat the samples. That's why we need a, a little device here where you can heat um, to inactivate RNases. And then manually you can push this, um, you know, the reaction into the three chamber chambers that I've told you, showed you before. And that can be with um, a, a light source read um, on, a, on a very simple device. So we're, we're developing this because we really think that this is a way to go potentially into a health phone um, system in the future where our phone is functioning a lot more than just um, a, a, a phone and a, and a picture taker, but potentially also as a, as a diagnostic in testing SARS-CoV-2 or others, um, uh, other viruses in the future. Now, this is a, a, um, a really close collaboration, uh, as I said, between Doudna, Doudna and Fletcher and my lab. Um, leading here was an MD PhD student, Parinas Fuzuni, and my lab, who really initiated this collaboration very early on with HIV and then led it through SARS CoV 2. Um, she worked closely with a senior, a senior scientist in, in Dan's lab, Sun Min Son, who has actually now taken um, this um, essay to the next level. 
And the next level is that we put it into a droplet-based workflow, um, similar to a DDPCR reaction, where you just simply emulsify uh, the reaction. You get a single molecule resolution in these um, in these droplets. We um, and then after emulsification, just by simply pipetting it up and down, you can. Um, <clears throat> you can then image by microscopy and quantify the um, fluorescence uh, by microscopy. And microscopy is, is good here because it, it helps us actually equalize between the different sizes of the, um, of the, uh, of the droplets and, and leads us to very precise outreads here. And this droplet is really, this droplet based technology is really now the next level um, in, in sensitivity and also offers us unique opportunities in multiplexing. And you can see that very early on, we see the number of, um, um, of, of droplets becoming green here. This is now our outread, not anymore the slope, but the, the number of droplets. And you can see while the intensity within the droplets is going to, um, increase over time, the number of droplets is fixed at five minutes. So we can read this essay basically as positive or negative after five minutes. And we can now enhance our, not surprisingly, our, um, our sensitivity because we're compressing basically a 300 microliter reaction into a 30 picoliter reaction. And you can see that uh, volume into a, yeah, into a volume. And you can see that our single guide sensitivity is now at 20 copies per microliter versus 100,000 copies per microliter. And, um, and if we multiplex, um, with eight guides, um, 28 guides here in this picture, but we have a seven guide combination now that is um, vetted for the, um, for the, for the droplet um, reaction. We go down to one copy per microliter and we have a lot of room actually to go better than, um, than PCR um, quality here. Now, the big advantage of, um, of this non-amplified um, system is that we have a hundred percent correlation between um, between our, um, you know, our viral load and our, um, you know, either slope in the bulk assay or number of droplets in the in the um, in the drop in the droplet assay, and that gives us really um, an immediate um, quantitative um, um, advantage, but also an incredible um, speed and um, simplicity of the reaction. Now, the, 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 the thing that we are the most interesting, interested in and excited about the, the droplet technology is really that we can now use the slope as the slope is no longer our measure of quantity. Uh, we can use it now as a characteristic to differentiate different variants. So every, every guide and every, every guide um, target interaction has basically a, a, a specific slope. I showed you at the beginning you know, the, the lousy um, guides and the good guides. Now, this, this can now be used as a differentiator, and we call this um, kinetic barcoding, basically, that we can now use to differentiate between variants or between different viruses within one reaction without changing the fluorophore, without changing the, the, um, the enzyme, or without um, separating or splitting our reaction in multiple other reactions, which is what everybody else is doing. So within one reaction, we can now include separate guides, or we can use one guide that and can then see if the if the guide is perfectly matching here in this case to the variant. This is the California variant here with a single mutation at that at that site. Um, we can see that uh, the variant um, is picking up the variant in the reaction with a steeper slope than the, than the wild type. And we can use this simple thing um, with a more than 98% um, accuracy to differentiate with, with, between patient samples that are either wild type or, um, or, um, or the California variant. And this has been now greatly expanded um, by, by, Su uh, by Sunmin and by, by Dan into a whole range of different um, you know, guides. You can go up to five to 10 of those in this space here uh, that you can differentiate between influenza, you can differentiate between Delta variants, and you can differentiate um, between other viruses in this reaction. So just to summarize this first part here, um, we have, um, um, you know, this direct detection with CRISPR-Cas13 a is, is possible in bulk and in droplet reactions. Um, this is really giving us a sensitivity now to uh, down to 10 copies per microliter in 30 minutes in a bulk reaction and one copy per microliter in five minutes in a, in a droplet reaction. The single molecule resolution in these droplets is really exciting because it lets us learn a lot about um, the enzyme um, and but also allows us um, kinetic barcoding. Um, 
And that leads to multiplexing of different targets with a single reporter. And we think we're extremely excited about the quantitative capabilities of this, um, of this essay for accurate, fast, and mobile RNA detection, not only for uh, viruses in the future, but also for uh, other uh, RNA-based biomarkers um, in, in, in the future. So. With this, I switch to the second part, which is the immunity part of my, of my talk, um, and um, acknowledging um, um, uh, Sayed, who is a, a postdoc in, in Jennifer Doudna's lab. Jennifer has a part of uh, has a has a lab at Gladstone, which is right next to mine, and we work very closely together. Um, so um, I, I consider Sayed my adopted postdoc in some way, and. Uh, and um, it works very closely with Taha, another very talented postdoc in my lab, and, and Takako, um, a senior scientist who is um, doing all of the BSL-3 work um, for them. And um, they have really, um, they have really got, gotten together and, um, and developed a new method to um, develop um, virus-like particles. Um, now, virus-like particles are um, sort of an in-between between the pseudotype particles that you might have heard of and are very much used in, 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 in testing spike uh, mutations um, and the full, uh, the full virus um, that we use in the BSL-3. Um, the, the difference is that uh, virus-like particles are really consisting of the SARS-CoV-2 structural proteins. It's not just a lentivirus with a spike protein on top of it. Um, it is really a, an authentic um, SARS-CoV-2 particle that contains the spike, uh, but also the nucleocapsid, which is extremely important, and also the two additional proteins, the M and the E protein, that, that make a SARS-CoV-2 particles. Now, in order to use a VLP as a, as a, as a, um, as a tool in the lab, um, you have to be able to incorporate um, some, you know, cargo into it, um, and this is done, and, and this requires the identification of a packaging signal. So usually, when we use a, um, a, a, a an HIV-based um, pseudotype virus, we use, you know, of course, we use the nuclear capsid of um, of HIV. We we package with an uh, an HIV-specific packaging signal, but for a SARS-CoV-2 VLP, we need um, something different. And so um, the first thing that Syed did is really map the packaging signal for, um, for SARS-CoV-2. He had um, precedent here because it, um, SARS-1 SARS was um, already, um, you know, identified the packaging signal or at least narrowed down. And he basically narrowed it down to a, a 20 amino acid sequence here between ORF a, a, a 1AB and, and the spike protein here in a similar location like in, in SARS-1 and has used this now fused um, to a reporter to incorporate um, cargo into the into the VLP. And that has really allowed now the, the, the generation of a very simple four um, plasmid and transfection method where you have you know, the, the structural proteins here on three plasmids, here a bisestronic plasmid of MNE, um, together with the luciferase or a GFP T20 uh, um, 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 packaging um, ca or cargo um, RNA here. And so um, when you co-transfect all of these four, you can see that generates the VLPs. The VLPs are then used to um, infect a, um, an, an, a, a, an acceptor cell line, in this case, a 293T ACE2 tempus 2 overexpressing cell line. And then you can just measure luciferase in that cell line as a measure of how many VLPs have been produced and entered into this um, produce and in, into this acceptor cell line. And you can see that only if you have all four plasmids uh, correctly um, um, co-transfected together, you get a very specific signal. If you omit any of those, um, the VLPs don't form and you don't, um, you don't get any signal. Now this um, now allows us to go beyond spike in terms of checking what uh, what variants are look like and what what mutations are really important for um, for infectivity. Um, in this case, we turned our attention to the N protein, which is a very critical protein of every of every particle. It basically is 
um, the core of the particle. It also is very important for RNA binding and incorporation. And um, in this case, we have the N-terminal and the C-terminal domain both um, used, um, you know, used for RNA binding, but also um, the C-terminal domain very important for oligomerization because that really makes the capsid of the of the virus. Um, now these two domains are connected by a linker motif, which is um, serine and arginine rich. And, um, and interestingly, this linker domain is one where there's a lot of mutations um, accumulating, um, you know, in addition to other mutations that are sort of sprinkled uh, uh, across the end and, and, and protein um, open reading frame. And when you mutate all of these mutations that at that time were known, um, you can see that the mutations in the linker domain, especially here in the serine arginine rich part of the linker domain, are really um, critical because these mutations are enhancing and sometimes uh, tenfold the, um, the, um, the VLP production slash um, infection of, of the acceptor cells. Um, when we look now what these mutations are doing, especially we focused on the three with the highest um, um, in, increase in, 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 in infectivity here that we observed, we found that the common denominator between them is that they all incorporate more, uh, that we find more RNA basically incorporated into, in, into particles in the supernatant. So we think that these N mutations are really critical um, to enhance um, 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 RNA packaging here and make more infectious particles, basically. We confirmed this with a full-length um, molecular clone. Uh, we use clone that has been, uh, you, uh, you know, very early published uh, um, at UTMB um, and, um, and have incorporated these single mutations into the end protein and the full-length protein in the full-length clone and could show that uh, indeed these two mutations here increase to the same extent um, the infection or the infectivity of this full length clone that we have seen um, with the VLPs. So this led us to conclude that um, that really the end mutations are very important, more important than actually the, the spike mutations that we did in comparison um, in order to um, you know, enhance um, the infectivity of, um, uh, of, of, of variant um, um, viruses and that this leads to more effective um, incorporation of RNA um, and likely to um, you know, a, a production of more infectious or more production of infectious particles in the supernatant. Um, now, we have now used also these VLPs to test immunity, especially antibody neutralization. Um, and it's very easy because you can now use the spike protein, either use the ancestral strain or the delta spike protein or the Omicron um, spike protein, um, put it onto the VLPs um, and then uh, incubate them with um, serum from either vaccinated or post-COVID um, 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 individuals um, and then see what your neutral neutralizing activity is. Um, and you can see, like many others have reported, including us, that, um, that, the, um, that Omicron um, is really um, decreasing, or, or usage of the Omicron spike is really decreasing the neutralizing activity of the vaccinated um, serum, both from Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna. Uh, very little observed here with J&J across the board. Um, um, and we see that um, the same is basically true for um, post-COVID where, where, where Omicron is lower, but not st st statistically significant um, versus this uh, ancestral or the Delta strain. These were non-boosted individuals, um, and you can see that the boost is helping very strongly. Um, um, the um, you know neutralization against Omicron um, up to 21 days after um, after the boost. Um, at least that's what we tested here in this S in in this essay. But you can see that compared to Delta and um, the ancestral strain, the boost for the Omicron um, is still significantly lower. Um, we have recently turned our attention also to, um, you know, uh, breakthrough infections um, together with uh, Charles Chu um, had done an, an extensive series of tests uh, for, for breakthrough in infections. We have also tested um, them ourselves. Um, and you can see here that, um, that a, a Delta breakthrough infection on a vaccinated background is really a very, very effective in increasing um, activity, neutralizing activity against um, Omicron. And I'm coming to the end here. Uh, we have very high correlation between 
um, the VLPs, uh, VLP neutralization activity and live virus neutralization activity. And just as a last slide, um, just completed a study in mouse and in humans where we can show that Omicron by itself is actually inducing a very narrow and limited um, 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 immune response only against Omicron, both in mice and in unvaccinated humans. However, if we look in the vaccinated people, Omicron is inducing, like Delta, a very um, broad and very um, um, and relatively robust response also against Omicron. So to, to summarize, the second part is I think the discovery of an RNA packaging signal allows for SARS-CoV-2 VLP generation as a new rapid tool to analyze immune evasion and spread. We have identified several end mutations in the linker regions that enhance viral infection by enhancing RNA packaging. Um, we used the recombinant viruses uh, to confirm the relevance of this, and this was also done for the Omicron variant recently. Um, and But we think that VLPs are a rapid uh, tool to analyze um, virus neutralization and have identified lim limited cross-variant immunization after Omicron infection without vaccination. With this, I end. Thank all the amazing people that have been, um, you know, involved in these studies. I think I acknowledged all of them except Raul and Irene, who were involved in the last study that I showed, literally the last slide, um, and um, all our collaborators, our supporters, and you, my my awesome lab. Um, check us out on our website, and you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melanie. That was uh, that was fantastic. Some exciting work. Um, I remind uh, attendees and panelists to raise your hand, um, and I'll, I'm happy to call on you. And I'd like to lead off with a couple of questions, um, probably with respect to both parts of your talk. Um, the first question is uh, expressing my own limited understanding. I didn't catch how you were doing the actual detection with your CAS-13 based um, assay. So we, uh, we have multiple ways of using it. Um, I think when we, um, we, we have in, in the original paper, and that's what I was sort of uh, promoting here in this talk, is that we're really using the, the mobile phone camera, which is- uh, mm, that's, that's not, that's sorry, not, that's not what I mean. What's the, yeah. what's the flora for, and how, how are you detecting a fluorescent signal? Um, how are you generating a fluorescent signal? Yes, yeah, so on, the fluorescent, the fluorescent we, we have different flora. Uh, this is a regular um, uh, fluorescent signal that is that is basically quenched, and that you um, that you have to um, you have to um, you know uh, use a laser to excite properly, and then you can actually um, 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 capture it with a with a mobile phone di uh, camera. So the mobile phone is really acting as a plate reader or as a um, you know as a recipient and 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 the um, uh, of the um, of the of the fluorescent signal. So this is there's nothing specific about this. This is really like in any in any. Um, uh, did we, we haven't modified in any way the fluorescent signal here to make it adaptable for the for the for the for the phone. Got it. I I'm going to ask a couple more questions before I let Rodney jump in. Um, so the, the 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 your ability to detect one copy of RNA per microliter is is astonishing in the droplet assay. And I'm just curious. I'm assuming based on your comments that you guys are considering applying this to things like uh, single cell analysis or something along these lines. And I'm just wondering um, how do the detection capabilities uh, align with the needs for that type of methodology compared to existing PCR-based methods? So what we have been doing currently is really um, using the supernatant basically, or the the serum from you know, or the or the nasal swabs from 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 patients. We're also doing this for for blood for other for other um, cell types, and then really doing a single cell a single molecule um, analysis. Um, um, by by distributing these um, you know reactions into into the droplets, we have not done anything with single cells at this point. I think what we know um, is that when we um, when we go into um, the context of a whole you know genome expressed genome, I think the sensitivity drops a little bit because I think simply the the the, the enzyme is 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 looking for the right um, RNA longer. Um, and we are working currently actually on, 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 on exciting depletion strategies in order to get 
you know, rid of, um, you know, um, anything that we don't want to test um, and to get uh, faster and, uh, and, and a more precise finding of the, um, of, the, of the RNA of our choice. So to go and look, uh, use that method for um, mRNA expression studies, I think that's something that is very exciting. And I think that's where you're getting to, um, I think is, is, is something that we're thinking very hard of that is currently, that we have currently not optimized, but we are working very hard on. And I think this is one of the, one of the optimization steps that we're taking. But in general, I would say that um, this is a really fast method to test for RNA in, in also in the laboratory. I think it takes, as I told you, pretty much five minutes. We have the whole reaction lyophilized. So you can take a lysate from, for example, a BSL-3 uh, supernatant. You, you mix it with your, with your lyophilized reaction. You measure. And in five minutes, you know how much virus you have in the, in the supernatant. And it's, it's, it's completely quantitative. So I think there's no reverse transcription. There's no amplification. And I think this is really what, what, what is so exciting about it. I think going into something like gene expression studies or biomarker circulating biomarker measurements, I think you need to be quantitative because this is a, an RNA that we have existing in our bodies and that have come at, at different concentrations. And I think here we need to be quantitative to have a real clean cut cutoff in terms of saying this is pathologic and this is normal um, versus um, you know a semi quantitative measurement that that we currently have. Perfect. I'm gonna I'm gonna let Rodney Rothstein ask his question. Rodney, you're, you should be able to talk. Yeah, um, that was great, and I loved your answer to um, Eric's. Eric's really wanting to know how much, how easily it's going to be to multiplex, but we can talk about that again. <laughs> um, so I, I have two questions. The first um, is about the first part. You're basically detecting nucleic acid, so you're not detecting viral particles that are infectious. I mean, I'm not saying that this is, I'm not saying it negatively. I just want to make sure. I no, know no, it. no, no, no. That's totally, I mean, that's something that we're very hardly, that we're very looking very hard at. Uh, but I think that that is what we, we, we're trying to distribute or find guide combinations that correlate better with infectious, with infectivity, um, you know, and plaque assays that we're doing tediously in the, in the BSL-3. But in general, this is just a normal uh, molecular test that, that discovers viral RNA, but we think that by looking at subgenomic and genomic ratios, I think we might get to a, to a better predictor here. Okay, and my second question is about, um, about genetic recombination. I get the impression that you, um, I'm wondering whether the pseudoviruses are actually undergoing genetic recombination in the same way that the virus does, um, and, whether, uh, and whether you have any worry about the possibility that you could be creating a, a variant in the lab that um, that could be really that could actually end up being avoid you know avoid immune responses etc. I, I think the recombination with the VLPs or the pseudoviruses I think diminished because we have you know not the genome that we are packaging we we have basically a reporter. Um, and um, and I think um, I think um, I think the, the 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 risk is much higher to do this when we use recombinant um, full length viruses here, and that's definitely something that is in, in, in everybody's mind. Sorry, my dog just entered here the room and is um, and is uh, very happy behind me here. Sorry for the noise. Yeah, no problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, if I if I can ask one more question. Um, with respect to the, 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 the mutants you find in the linker region of the N protein that enhance packaging, are the two mutants that showed the biggest effect, um, I think they were S202 and R203, um, were those, are those found in, in <laughs> nature? Yes, or, all of them are found in nature. All of them and, that we tested are found in nature. One of it is found in the Delta. Um, the Omicron has a, a slight, slightly different one um, than the two uh, or three M and R. I don't know. I have to go back and look at it. Um, it also is, um, but the the N protein of um, of Omicron is also very highly infectious in terms of um, um, putting it into the VLP system. So both Delta and um, Omicron have mutations in that linker region. 
um, Omicron has a, also a deletion in addition, which also seems to be important for this, for this phenotype. So yes, these are all natural mutations. We would not be able to put them into the full length virus because it would be considered gain of function. Yeah, and just, just um, out of curiosity, is it clear that those mutations are causing an enhanced uh, packaging in, in the virus, in, in wild type situation? Well, and as far as we can tell, yes, because when we reconstruct this virus with this mutation, with only this mutation, with that one single mutation, we get the same enhanced phenotype that we get with the VLP um, in terms of um, in terms of enhanced spread. Oh wow! Okay. So okay. Yeah, we're working very much on this mutation. We think actually that the phosphorylation status of this linker region is very important, and that the mutations affect this, and that changes the uh, RNA packaging.